Vignette number one. A young woman was getting ready for a date, and she was anticipating the date, and suddenly her doorbell rang, and so she walked to open the door, and her hair was standing up on end from back combing, and she opened the door, and there was her date very, very early. And so she was a little bit embarrassed, and so she decided to make the best of the situation and said, so, what do you think? <laughs> and he said, I think something beautiful is about to happen. Vignette number two. A woman walks into the living room with her hair in big curls. And her husband said to her, what happened to your hair? And she said, I said it. And he responded, when does it go off? <laughs> James 3, verse 10 says, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. Brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. These two vignettes sort of give us an idea of two approaches to life. Either we bless or we curse. Now, of course, it kind of seems obvious which one we would want to choose. Of course, we want our life to be a blessing. But I think more often than not, and partly because we just don't know we're doing it, we actually choose to curse. We choose to curse. Now, I want to tell you a story that drove this point home to me. And it was revealed when I went to a concert put on by the singer-songwriter David Wilcox. And this is when I was living in San Francisco about 20 years ago. Now, if those of you who know David Wilcox, he is such a heartfelt, wonderful writer, poet, and he plays guitar so fantastic. And after about one-third of the concert, all our hearts had been broken several times by his beautiful songs. And then he said, you know, I want to share this new song that I just wrote with you. Because I think, I think you'll really get it. You'll feel it in your heart. And so we were all ready for this other heartbreaking, beautiful song about life, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I want to play a little bit of that song for you. But I also want to forewarn you, the words of this song might be considered inappropriate or even uncalled for, particularly in this setting. But I play it for you, I take the risk to sing it for you because of how powerful the words were in order to show all of us who were at this concert that we were choosing to curse way more often that we choose to bless. So I, I guess I'm asking for forgiveness in advance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs>
concert roared with laughter because David Wilcox had revealed the hidden secrets of our hearts driving on the freeways in the San Francisco Bay Area. And just before his concert, I think Time Magazine came out with a front cover that said gridlock, and it was a picture of a bridge in San Francisco Bay Area. All of us were driving in our cars, and we were saying things to people around us. You idiot, why did you cut me off? All that frustration had built up, and when he sang that song, we realized that that was what we were doing to everyone around us. And we laughed so hard because we got exposed. I got exposed. I realized how mad I would get at people for cutting in front of me or not letting me make a, a tournament change. Now, for those of you who live in this area and your occasional excursions to Denver, <laughs> you may know exactly what I'm talking about. Those moments where we let people have it with our words or our attitudes, and it really is something that we have to deal with. Now, our cursing of other people doesn't necessarily end when we pull into our garages or our parking spaces and we get out of our car. On the highway of life, where each of us commute daily, no matter where you live, or even if you don't even go out of your house, when all these other people stack up in our way, they block our path, they cause us problems, people who irritate us, we easily choose to curse them in our minds and with our words. We pull out our weapons and blast away sharp words, hostile or cold attitudes, body language, <coughs> sarcasm, withdrawal of love. And most of the time, we're not even aware we're doing it. In the ancient world, in the Hebrew scriptures, they knew that words had lasting power and effect. And we see this in the story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob tricked his father Isaac into giving him the blessing that belonged to his older brother Esau. And once Esau found out about it, he came to his father Isaac and said, No, give the blessing to me. It's mine. I'm the eldest son. It's mine. And Isaac said, I can't undo it. It has already been spoken. It is already accomplished. They knew that a blessing or a curse had power. Now it's interesting, it's not just our words that bless or curse. It's our intentions. They don't even have to leave our lips, but our intentions, the things we think about others, are blessings or curses. Psalm 62, verse 4 says, They bless with their mouth, but inwardly they curse. This is known as a mixed message. And a fairly recent study found that people understood what other people were saying to them in this fashion, they understood what they felt from someone else only 7% based on words, but 35% based on the tone of voice, and 58% from body language. In other words, we can say beautiful things with our words, but our body language, our internal intentions can curse. And I think we have sort of forgotten in this day, day and age that blessings and curses have lasting effects on us. How many of us have had conversations with people who feel that the words, intentions, and actions of parents, family, school teachers, or the church they grew up in had disfigured their soul rather than blessed it? <laughs> so I'd like you just to take a moment and think about the words and behaviors and intentions that have cursed you and blessed you. Who comes
comes to mind? What did they say? How did they act towards you? What was their attitude towards you? They either felt like a curse or truly blessed you. As a pastor and a spiritual director, I have had so many conversations with people who have talked about the ways that they have been cursed by people in their church and people in their family. Some have said, you know, we went to church every Sunday, but my, my parents didn't even curse at us, but their attitudes toward me, their actions, left something really hard for me to get out from under as I tried to grow and understand God's deep love for all of us. So, a curse can certainly um, harm us and it can harm the ones that we send the curse to. Um, nine months ago, I was in a car accident coming back from Rocky Mountain National Park. They found they found out that I had a spot on my brain that was causing me to have seizures. And so I couldn't drive. And I was starting on anti-seizure medicines. And so I'd been in that regime for about a month and a half. And I'm walking to a medical appointment in Denver, <coughs> getting ready to cross the street, a one-way street. And I saw a woman pull up in a car getting ready to take a right-hand turn. So she was going to go in front of me, and I knew that because it was a three-lane street, that she had plenty of time, and the light changed green, she would go, and I'd start walking across. That happened. The light turned green. She went across in front of me. But I didn't see was another car had pulled up behind her, and I'm walking across halfway through the crosswalk, and this woman takes a right turn, and she didn't even look and she's going to hit me, and I stop, and I put my hands up like this. She looks up at the last second, and she slams on her brakes, and she goes, oh, I'm sorry. And I cursed at her in my heart. My heart. Why did open your eyes? And then she quickly you know, ran across in front of me, and it took off, and I'm yelling at her, sort of, and I'm walking across the street, and I go, oh, wait a minute. I don't know what you have just gone through in your life, but bless you, I said, bless you. I have no idea what you've just gone through. And just my verbalizing it out loud changed that anger in me, that desire to curse, into a desire to bless. And I don't know if my blessing had any effect on her whatsoever, but it had an amazing effect on me. The anger in my body was gone. <coughs> Simply because I chose to bless, not just silently, but to say it out loud, to get it in my body, to actually feel it. But maybe here's the heart of the question. Do we bless or curse ourselves? Do we bless or curse ourselves? The writer Henri Nouwen writes in his book, Life of the Beloved. He says, claiming your own blessedness always leads to a deep desire to bless others. The characteristic of the blessed ones is that wherever they go, they always speak words of blessing. It is remarkable how easy it is to bless others, to speak good things to and about them, when you yourself are in touch with your own blessedness. The blessed one always blesses. And this leads me to talk about an idea of Matthew Fox. And he talks about original blessing <coughs> rather than original <coughs> sin. When Jesus was 
baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist. He comes up out of the water and he hears these words. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then we see Jesus treat other people as beloved sons and daughters of God. His baptism by John the Baptist didn't make Jesus a son of God. It celebrated it. It recognized it. And the same is true for us in our sacrament of baptism. It doesn't make it so. It celebrates what is already deeply true just because you are made in the image of God. After Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, no, he said to the Pharisees, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. And then Jesus asked the woman caught in adultery, where are your accusers? And there was no one to accuse because they had all slinked off. And then Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. And I can almost hear Jesus add the words, so neither should you condemn yourself. Jesus doesn't condemn us. Why should we? There's a wonderful writer named Gerald May. And in his book, The Awakened, the Awakened Heart, he tells this story about his four-year-old son named Paul. He says... We used to live next door to a grouchy old man. He put up a chain link fence when our children began to play in the backyard. We tried to make friends with him, but he would have none of it. And he threatened to hurt my son Paul's kitten after it strayed into his rose bushes. He said, I see that cat in my yard again, I'll poison it. Paul, who was four at the time, became obsessed with keeping the kitten inside the house. And sometimes he'd wake up screaming at night in fear for his cat's life. A few days later, the kitten was dead. We saw it die, and we were sure it had been poisoned. While the rest of the family was grieving and making up fantasies about what we could do for revenge against that neighbor, little four-year-old Paul got very quiet. And finally, he had something to say about our neighbor. Four-year-old four Paul said, he must be very lonely. Maybe we should give him a birthday party or something. We have a choice to curse or to bless. When does it go off? Or, I think something beautiful is about to happen. Plan revenge or plan a birthday party. Have we been cursing others? Have we been cursing ourselves? do have a choice. And I think it begins by remembering who we all are. We are blessed sons and daughters.